So here's how my February reading month went. At first I thought I wasn't reading enough, so I raced to read more and I read a lot of great things. But by the end of the month, I realized I had read a ton of books, much more than I thought. And then the war flashbacks of that daunting December wrap up video came back. <laughs> I'm Roxy, this is Rocky Bias, and today I'm finally telling you about all the books that I read in February. They are not as many as in December, thank God, but yeah, they're still quite a lot and a lot of them I have a lot of thoughts on. So let's just get on with it. First, I'm going to say that I read three of the six books for the non-fiction book to prize octafinals. I can't say what they are, but since I'm not going to review them, I'm going to keep those to myself until early April, where I'm going to be filming a joint review of the six books, sharing my ranking of them, and then my reaction to the prize, because I think that is the best way of doing it. It's how a lot of booktubers I like do it, and yeah, I just feel it's the most exciting way. I also read Pedro Paramo by Juan Rulfo. This was February's pick for reading Latinas for some godforsaken reason. I couldn't find my copy, which is hilarious because I'm sure it got lost in the moving of books precisely because I said, oh, I should keep it near so I can take it to my apartment, but then I didn't right away and that was my mistake and now I couldn't find it. So I just read it as an ebook. It's a very interesting book. It was a reread for me. We read it in high school. It was my first refresher since it blew my mind when I was in high school and I liked it a lot, but I didn't love it in the same way than before, which is not a good sign with a book. I wanted to go the other way. But in any case, this is about Juan Preciado who goes to this town in search of his father because his mom has just died and it all gets very ghostly, he soon realizes. And through these different choral vignettes of these different citizens of this town, we get stories of who Pedro Paramo was. And it's actually, he is the main character. And even more than Pedro Paramo as a person as an individual, it's what he represents, is this patriarchal idea of the town owner, of the authority figure, of the father figure, and how he affected this town and what happened to this town. It has a strong sense of place, a very hot, claustrophobic atmosphere. It's so good. I didn't love it as much because in the end, I do think it is a little bit more style than substance. I think the form is so good, but once you know what's going on, it's not as impactful as the first time you read it. I still super recommend it. I also think it's very accessible. Go check out the live stream and comment if you want to discuss. Okay, now on to the books. First, I want to mention books that were only okay. So let's begin with the last book I finished in the month, actually. The a novel of Stella Fitzgerald by Therese and Fowler. And here's the thing, this book is just fine. It was very readable, like all the things of the blurb here say compulsively readable. It's true. And it was good for me because I was so stressed out the last week of February. It helped, I devoured it, but I found a lot of flaws. And the fact that I flew through it wasn't actually a compliment. It was because I didn't feel the need to stop and analyze stuff because I don't think there is much to analyze here. This is about Stella Fitzgerald and her meeting Scott, and it follows her from birth to death, basically, it's first person narrative. And I can tell Fowler did her research, it's much too clear. It's always hard. I posted on Instagram whether people liked or not uh, fiction based on real people. And it was, it was very, very split, that vote. But I don't mind it. But I do think it's hard. It's hard because, especially with someone who's such a celebrity, it's hard not to want to do that, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. And you can do that if it's good. But in this case, I think Fowler is very clear about what her narrative wanted to be. And in the process, she made Zelda such a victim. And she was in many ways. I'm not saying that she isn't, but I think she flattened her character 
quite a lot. She also flattened everyone else around her. If you're going to write about the characters, you need more depth. The prose was fine. It was a bit too self-aware. It was first person and sometimes Zelda was analyzing the situation too much, almost as if she had the hindsight. I would not recommend this unless you want a really, really fluffy, light book to spend some time with these characters who, fair enough, are quite exciting. The atmosphere is exciting, but even that, I don't think it's particularly well accomplished. So yeah, I didn't love it and I don't think it's a particularly good book, but it was what I needed at the time. So maybe it's what you need too. Who knows? I also want to talk about Murder on the Orient Express, which is my third Agatha Christie book. This is a Hercule Poirot mystery and it's my first one. I really enjoyed it. This is a movie tying cover, but I happen to really, really like that movie. I thought it was good. It's just that my second Agatha Christie was and then there were none and I haven't gotten over it basically. I think that book is so genius. So this was good, but not that good. It's about Hercule Poirot being on the Orient Express. It's a log room mystery. One passenger is killed and Poirot must solve the crime considering that there are all these passengers, some of whom have a lot of direct connections to the murdered guy. It also made me realize how nasty Poirot is. I've seen a couple of adaptations and I've never seen him as nasty. He's a bit, you know, full of himself in the way that all brilliant detectives are. Texturally speaking, I think Poirot is really nasty with his assistants, especially because they don't know each other, so it comes across as even more cruel because there isn't that bond. I still really enjoy this. I think Christie is such a master of tension, even though I knew how it ended. There was a point where I doubted myself. I was like, am I remembering this wrong? She uses sparse language to create tension and she really, really fleshes out characters through dialogue, which is hard to do in a way that is not too contrived. So yeah, kudos to this one. I thought it was good. Oh, actually I should have talked about this one first because I liked it less than the Orient Express. But anyways, I also read my second Evelyn Waugh, Right Should Revisit It, because it fit two of my own little um, challenges I'm doing. So you're going to listen to me talk more about this on my first Gilmore Girls challenge reading wrap up because I only have to finish one more and I'll be able to film that video. This is about Sebastian and another guy who is the narrator and they are friends and it's very gay until it isn't. Charles, I think, is the other guy, gets involved with Sebastian's sister. I think Sebastian should have remained the main character because those sections, the beginning, I was actually quite engrossed. They are in Oxford, this very collegiate homosocial environment, and they discuss art and life and aesthetics, all that jam that I love. But then it becomes dark in a not so interesting way, and Sebastian disappears, and you only get him through his absences. Oh, he's become an alcoholic, and <laughs> it was all right. I enjoyed the prose much, much more it's much better than Scoop, so that gives me hope. I wouldn't especially recommend this, but it is one of those staples of like dark academia, so if you want a dark academia classic, you can check out Brad Should Revisit It. I definitely think the first part is worth it. Yeah, make of that what you will. I will be talking a bit more about the style and everything in that video, so look forward to that whenever it comes. I also read Sex and Lies by Leila Slimani. This is subtitled The Sex Lives of Women in Morocco, although I may be lying because this is an edition in Spanish. I body read this with my friend Danny, and this was translated into Spanish by Malika Embarek Lopez. I really enjoyed this, but I was underwhelmed by it. I thought this was informative because these are interviews with different women that Slimani basically just transcribes. That's the thing. It occasionally goes away from the interviews to the author reflecting upon it, but it's not too often. It was just interviews transcribed and that was disappointing because it doesn't have an overarching theme. I mean, it does, but it doesn't have, you know, a structured theme. It doesn't have that sense of connection to something broader, doesn't have those interesting insights. And I know 
a lot of authors, especially those of more journalistic inclinations, don't want to be too meddlesome and they think these testimonies are so important that you should just read them straight from the source and they are just vessels for transmission and that their insight will only pollute it in a way. And I understand that. But as a reader in a book like this, reading interview after interview, of a situation that's so similar does get very repetitive. I still recommend it because I think it's an important source. It was sold as a collection of essays, but it's actually a collection of interviews. And so if you want to read interviews, then this is fine. But if you want a bit more commentary or insight, then this is not the book for you. A book that is referenced there though, that I really want to read is Hymans and Scarves, Why This East Needs a Sexual Revolution, which I own thanks to Danny actually, and I really, really want to read, but I haven't yet. <laughs> but that book is referenced in Sex and Lies, and I really am looking forward to it. For Invisible Cities, I only read one of the books, although I have books for all three countries. Yeah, I, I have no excuse. I read Tabafis, Recuerda Cuerpo, or Remember Body. This, I think, is an anthology, again, originally in Spanish, but of course, you can find Tabafis poetry translated into English quite easily. I Think. And the translation is by Ana Potitu and Rafael Herrera. By the way, this poet is known as a Greek poet, I assume because he writes in Greek language, but he was born in Egypt and he popped up when I was searching for Egyptian authors. So I'm counting it. These are poems about homosexuality and lost youth, and I had no idea. So I felt very much like I had come here looking for the bare minimum of good poetry and suddenly all these themes of body and desire were here and the meter is so interesting and the language is so beautiful. I was like, damn, Kavafis, I had no idea. I really enjoyed this. I marked a lot of them because I thought they were beautiful. There are some of them that are denser because they reference Greek mythology or Greek history actually even more so than mythology and I'm actually quite rusty in that area. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. It's a very central collection and one very common theme was the loss of youth and remembering youth as those times when your body was young and beautiful and you know it's that's a very common Uranian slash Greek boy love sort of ethos. I read one more poetry book, Wendy Cope's Serious Concerns. How gorgeous is this paper 90th anniversary edition? This is Dorothy Parker. If Dorothy Parker hadn't been so depressed, <laughs> she is very snarky and funny, but much simpler, I think. It was much more hit or miss, but because the hits were such big hits with me, I still enjoyed it. I, again, marked quite a lot of poems. I think they are very good. I think these are good for people who are just starting out in poetry and want to get it. I think they would enjoy it because it, it's mostly about the language itself. I usually go more for imagery. Here I think it's more of simple everyday imagery with some cleverness thrown in and I think that's fine. I think it works. What I will say though is that it's very British. It has a very British sensibility but still I liked it. I would read more by Wendy Cope. So, now let's go to Kentuckys. Oh my god, it's not Kentuckys. I keep saying Kentuckys, but I forget that in English it's called Little Eyes by Samantha Schweblin. This is the cover in Spanish. I hate that they changed it to Little Eyes because Kentuckys is a word that is on the novel. And it's not like Kentuckys is a word that has any meaning in Spanish either. Anyways, I really enjoyed this much more than I expected because a lot of people really didn't like it and I heard a lot of mixed reviews. I don't think this is nearly as good as Fever Dream, but I still enjoyed it much more than I expected. It's a collection of vignettes and they are interrelated. It's a novel, but I feel like each storyline reads more like a short story until it all comes together in the end. It's about this scenario in our world where Kentuckys are a thing, they are machines, if you will, that have an odd animal-like shape and they are sold as devices or toys and they connect you to someone else at random in the world and so they see you and they can move the Kentucky and you have zero power over the Kentucky effectively you can not charge it but other than that that said you can disconnect it but once you disconnect it you can't reconnect it 
I thought it was so fun to read. I was very engaged. I read this in one sitting basically because I keep wanting to know how scenarios would play out. There was one scenario that I thought was kind of unnecessary so that tells you a lot it is a short novel. When you want to make a short novel shorter I always feel like that's a problem. There was one storyline that I would have done without. But it's basically commenting on, you know, technology and the dangers of technology. And also there are a few instances where technology can help. Also what it means to be seen and be the seer in social media. Why would anyone want to have a strange creature that looks at you and you know someone is behind that camera but you don't know who that person is you can't really communicate you can find ways to communicate with it but you're not really meant to it's all very obvious there are some paragraphs where it hits you over the head with it and it's not necessary but also because of the characters she chose to put those thoughts into i thought worked i like that the characters are so different in location, in age range. I think it shows how technology or specifically social media can impact different people on different stages. It, it just rang very true to life. One of the people go and buy it and they are not sure why they want to buy it, but they just describe the box as being very appealing and white and slick. I was like, huh, I, yeah. And the fact that they don't really explain more about them I think also rings very true. There are a lot of little knickknacks that have come and gone through the history of technology and you think, why would you want that? But people want it when it's just released. When you think that, for example, something like Omegle or Chat Roulette exists where people literally put themselves on display on camera to just get random strangers and sometimes they don't even see each other. It's just very odd but it's something that happens and i think this plays it out very well i like the prose i was engaged oh i wasn't very specific about the storylines so there are several where they get the kentucky for the first time they are experimenting with it there is a mother who's like a middle-aged woman who doesn't get it at first and then she is a kentucky meaning she's observing someone she becomes very attached to the young woman that is her owner and then there are others that are kids there are others that are profiting off it there is one that buys it just because and i think she's also a young woman so there are many types of people that are invested in these situations i understand that there is a lack of resolution and i understand that the message is very obvious but that's the thing at least it didn't feel to me that she was pontificating. It felt to me like she was exploring all these avenues. I don't recommend it as a follow-up to Fever Dream. I think that book is nearly damn perfect, but I think it's it's a relevant novel and I actually enjoyed it more than I expected. I also finished Brothers Karamazov, yep, by Fyodor Dostoevsky, and this is translated to Spanish by Jose Lain Entralgo. What can I say about this book? It's my first Dostoevsky. I enjoyed it, but I found it so over the top, quite honestly. And here's where I don't know if I'm getting it right or not. But I had the impression that Dostoevsky was the serious, gritty counterpart to fluffy, lush Tolstoy. I feel like that is the general consensus of the educated literary community. But I loved Anna Karenina and I got it even if there were details that I couldn't maybe understand because of context or certain social cues and gestures, whatever. But I didn't find it over the top or extremely dramatic. For all the human drama it contains, I still thought, okay, I believe this. This is very serious. I was in it for the ride. In here, I was kept thinking, is this really how people behaved when Dostoevsky was around? Or maybe he's exaggerating for effect and that's part of the satire. So. I feel like I need someone who knows their shit when it comes to Dostoevsky to explain this to me. This is about four brothers. One of them is a bastard and their father, who is a bastard for different reasons. Also, before we get a bit more into it, the way this is usually described is spoilerish because the fact that is presented as 
the central aspect to the novel happens halfway in. And this is a thousand page novel. So you can understand why spoiling something that happens 500 pages in might not be the greatest idea. Anyways, the first 500 pages are basically following the brothers on their own. There is some women trouble and let me not start on the women. Although they have their sassy moments in general, it's misogyny <laughs> everywhere. But then the second part is the aftermath of this event. Again, I enjoyed it, but I didn't find the writing especially breathtaking. I understood the philosophical aspects and it does have some amazing monologues and it does have the hermit amazing. I really like that character. The hermit was so interesting, but overall I wasn't too sold. Maybe I am missing context, true, and I am missing some knowledge of Dostoevsky and some analysis tools, fine. But I also didn't feel inclined to seek out those things from what I was reading. Whereas with Tolstoy, it was like, oh, I want to reread Anna Karenina so many times and I want to know more and it really fueled this interest in Russian literature. And I know those two authors are doing completely different things and I know their literary projects are quite different. But as two great authors of huge books, I think it's a fair comparison. So yeah, I don't know. Have you read this? What do you think about it? I, again, liked it. I also was surprised by its humor, but I didn't love it. Oh yes, then I read two Nona Fernandez books. The first one is Chilean Electric, which sadly, although that is the original title, is not translated into English, I don't think. It's amazing. It's about this story that Nona's grandmother, or the grandmother of the narrator, who is basically Nona Fernandez, auto-fictional sort of situation. Used to tell her this story, her father, who was a German immigrant in Chile, worked in the electrical wiring company that first illuminated the center of Santiago. And she was there and she tells this beautiful story. It's great, except for the fact that it can't be true because that happened 30 years before her grandmother was born. So that fake, anecdote is a starting point for the author to analyze ideas of progress and class and what that means in Chile and memory and collective memory and whether the importance is in the thing itself that occurred or in the telling of the thing. So it's very interesting that way. I really loved it. It's my favorite Nona Fernandez so far. I will continue to read more by her. If you read in Spanish or if it's ever translated into English, I really recommend it because it's so damn good. Then we have Space Invaders, which was a reread. I loved it just as much as the first time. This is about the dictatorship, but more specifically growing up during the dictatorship. And it's all told through their eyes. There is one point where one of the children becomes an adult and he's looking back, but in general, it talks about them and how they communicate between each other and how they send letters, they visit each other and what they understand and what they don't and it's so heartbreaking but also so interesting adorable in some ways sometimes quite heartwarming but in others completely heartbreaking her writing is so good it's so clever we talked about these two books with Danny in our podcast in Spanish, Luma Bandaya, link down below. One of the things I kept harping on was how Nona uses these metaphors that could feel so trite but she works them in seamlessly. She really trusts her readers. She's such a trusting author, but it's also not obscure. It's easy to understand as you read it. It's just that it works so well. So yeah, really, really recommend this. Remember, I'm doing ranking of dictatorship related books. Okay, this is the third one you need to read. You've read The House of the Spirits, you've read My Tender Matador, which is the best one. Now you have to read Space Invaders. So there you go. Okay, moving on, we have The Dinner by Hermann Koch. This was translated from Danish to Spanish, Marta Arguile Bernal. I will credit the English translator down below, don't worry about it. I really enjoyed it. I know what all the hype is about now. I've been meaning to read this for years. I got this years ago and it was one of those books that I hope to get to right away, which is not always the case. I sometimes buy books knowing full well I won't get to read them at the moment. But this one, I was like, okay, I'm going to pick it up right away and I never did. Now was the moment. This is about our protagonist who is 
having dinner duh, with his brother and their wives. His brother is a politician and he's actually running for president. They begin to talk and for a while that's it. But soon you understand that there's something going on with the protagonist and narrator's son. It's the first person narrative, one of those brilliant instances where the narrator is presenting you a reality and he's unreliable. This is really how he sees things and this is really how he sees himself and he is in such a profound denial about many things. But you as the reader know that this is not the case and there is a slight crack there where you can glimpse at the reality. It works so well. It did drag a bit like in the middle, a tiny bit. I kept wanting to read, I kept wanting to know more more. It is a commentary, again, on how we perceive ourselves and our lives and our image versus that of others, family relationships, sibling rivalry, and most importantly, father-son relations and what it means to be a good dad and raise a good kid. So good. The penultimate book I want to tell you about is The Corrections by Jonathan Franzen. I body read this with Danny as well. I told you we do a lot of book related activities together even though we live literally in different continents if you consider North and South America as two different continents. Anyways, this was my second Jonathan Franzen. The first one was Freedom, devoured it, really really enjoyed it. Didn't devour it because it was a body read so we sort of spaced it out through time but each of the sections when I had to read them, I devoured them because they were so good. So this is about an older marriage, Enid and Arthur, I want to say, I think so, and their children, Alfred. Oh my God, I always get those names mixed up. So Enid and Alfred and their three children. Oh my God, Chip, Gary and Denise, that's it. And it's just the story of their lives. It starts near Christmas, Alfred, is starting to become unstable, something might be going on in his brain. The children are scattered through the country. They are discussing whether to go home or not for the holidays, which is always, you know, family drama prime season. <laughs> Where are they going to spend the holidays? What is going on in their lives? Their parents are going to judge them. All of the characters here are horrible in many ways, but there are some that are less horrible than others. The worst one is Chip. I fucking hate Chip. He's disgusting. What is great is that he does disgusting things, but the book ridicules him. Jonathan Franzen is so good at just exploring the worst of human character in a way that could be so over the top, but how he writes it makes it intense and ring true to life. So I really, really enjoyed it. The ending was superb. I don't know if this will make my best fiction of the year because we have such a long way to go, but so far, is up there, it's up there. It just reminded me what just plain great solid writing can do for exploring human character and how engaging it can still be. And then we have a reread of a book you all know I adore. I reread Less by Andrew Shangrier. <laughs> Guys, I think this might be my favorite all time book. I am not good with commitment in almost any aspect of my life. I started by committing to a favorite film. I have since committed to a favorite song, but I never thought I would see the day where I'd feel the need to commit to a favorite book. Reading this, however, gives me such fuzzy, happy, warm feelings. And at the same time, every time I reread it, I find interesting things with the narrative and I fall in love. I think this might be my favorite. Okay, so what is this about? This is about Arthur Les. He is about to turn 50. He is a gay minor author who was once in a very committed relationship with a very famous poet called Robert. And the book starts with Arthur going on this crazy adventure around the world, basically, in order to avoid his ex not boyfriend of nine years wedding because they broke up and his boyfriend was much younger which is kind of a cool mirror of less having been 
the younger in a relationship and never expecting falling in love for someone younger himself when he was 40 and now Freddy, that's the name of his ex, is getting married and so he invites Arthur and Arthur's like hell nah I'm gonna get the hell out of here and accepts all these crazy invitations. It is hilarious. I'm going to make a video about humor and literature because I there are some thoughts that I want to discuss with you. It's also very sweet and it's not cynical. It also reflects upon the larger questions of life. That is, what does it mean to have a good life? What does it mean to be important? And is recognition everything? And why do we write? And why do we create art? This was a very controversial Pulitzer Prize winner. And I bring this up every time I talk about this book, but it's because I think a lot of people overlook how subtle and how great this novel is because it is effectively a rom-com in a way. There is this will they won't they kind of element to it and it is funny and it is heartwarming, but it's also so insightful and it does it in such a clever way where the prose goes down so nicely but when you dissect it and believe you me I have dissected it it's doing so many different things I just think it's so good anyways I love this book I know it's not for everyone it is a great version of existential crisis when you take it in a comedic way and it actually talks about that about whether we think life is tragedy or comedy and because I do love comedy studies in general I cannot gush enough this is my promise to you I'm going to talk less about this book the next time I reread it. But I can't promise it won't show up because again, I think this is my favorite book of all time. I don't wanna let go of it. So let's just do the outro like this. Nah, I'm kidding. Okay, that was it. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you enjoyed it, please give a thumbs up. Please subscribe and comment. Have you read any of these books? Do you plan on reading any of these books? And um, any comments that you might have. Do you have a favorite book? I think that's a very interesting question. Some people find it very hard to pick just one and I understand that but apparently I'm one person who can now. Who would have thought? Also remember to listen to The Bibliophile Daily, my podcast of daily literary facts, link down below with a card where you can find all the links to that. Remember to follow Reading Latinas, remember to brush your teeth and wear a mask. I don't know where I'm going. It's been such a crazy week and yeah, I'm I'm running on too much coffee and too little sleep. I've been reading some great things. Oh, also no jar today. Stuff has happened and I'm in the middle of too many books now. I will get to that when the time for the March wrap-up comes. But that's all for now. See you next time.